happy to be able to introduce today uh, Rika Rupsat and John Bartlett. And they are musicians and uh, folklorists and writers and based in Princeton. And they're going to be talking to us about summer camps, which will be very interesting because I'm just thinking about sending my own son off to summer camp this year. So I'm looking forward to hearing some of the stories that you have to share, or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rita and John. Summer camps are a fairly recent, historically fairly recent phenomenon. They started in the northeastern United States with uh, well-to-do middle-class people who were, um, first of all, trying to get the sons of the well-to-do who were not at boarding school in the summer away from the city and its various temptations and into summer camps. And the other aspect of it was the philanthropic ones where they get kids who were living in working class areas into nature. The YMCA was one of the early organizations there and there was an organization in Britain called the Boys Brigade. And it is for the promotion of habits of obedience, reverence, discipline, and self-respect. So a tall order. And of course the Boy Scouts, which were formed after the Boer War with the, with the um, inspiration of Lord Baden Poole. Uh, the backbone of the formation of summer camps is Christianity, of course, patriotism, discipline. And in Canada, Anglicanism was a very strong part of this, and milit militarism. And I remember when I went to England and saw all these Union Jacks in the churches, and it confused me, and then I realized, of course, this is a national church. So nationalism, patriotism, and Christianity are all tied together, and the Boy Scouts is really the epitome of that. Essentially, the summer camps in Canada were for the propagation of the sensibilities of the civilized parts of British Europe. So in summer camps in BC, there was a place where children could be immersed in the culture and the values of colonial civilization. There's a class element to this in that summer camps are predominantly middle class. Most working class kids don't go to summer camp. Uh, so it's a, it's a class thing attended predominantly by middle class whites who want to get back to nature. So that's a context. Anyway, I'm going to start with a song that I'm sure you all know and I'm going to lower this a bit so I'm not singing it too loud. If you don't know this song, you're the exception because every person, I interviewed about 55 people for this book and every one of them knew this song. There were beans, beans, as big as submarines in the storm, in the storm. There were beans, beans, as big as submarines in the quartermaster's store. My eyes are dim, I cannot see, I have not brought my specs with me, I have not brought my specs with me. There was butter, butter, a floating in the gutter, in the stove, in the stove. There was butter, butter, a floating in the gutter, in the quartermaster's store. My eyes are dim, I cannot see, I have not brought my specs with me, I have not brought my specs with me. I see your education has not been neglected. There are many more verses, but we won't go on and on about it. One of the chapters in the book is about the activities that happen at summer camp, and the activities were pretty typical throughout most of the people that I interviewed. You know, you get up in the morning and you do your various things. I remember I once described the daily round at summer camp to a friend of mine who had never been there and they said, that sounds like being in the army where every minute of the day is programmed. And there is actually a correlation between the army and summer camp because that song Quartermaster Store comes out of the military, but it's a staple at every summer camp. I remember quite clearly the daily schedule of activities when I went to summer camp in the late 50s and early 60s. You get up early, then you have your ablutions, flag raising, and breakfast, 
cabin cleanup, very important, gets inspected too, just like the army. First round of activities, lunch, canteen or tuck shop, depending on what camp you go to, where you get to buy candies and stuff after lunch, rest period, second round of activities, supper, free time, flag lowering, so you put the flag up in the morning, you take it down at night, flag is very important of course, ablutions, campfire, hot chocolate, bedtime. Somewhere in there was a church service in the outdoor chapel, and during my interviews with campers, I found that most of them had the same sequence of events during the day. At camp, you get up early. When Jack attended scout camp in Ontario in the 1960s, he was awakened at six o'clock every morning by a gun. It was a sort of a cannon, something like the nine o'clock gun in Coal Harbor in Vancouver. We didn't wear our scout uniforms in camp, but we had to bring them in case we were assigned to do cannon report. After the gun went off, somebody from each troop had to get up, put on their uniform, get down there, raise the flag, and then get instructions for what's going on today. This was called the cannon report. One of the gags was to get some new camper to get up early to do all this and come back with the cannon report. Inevitably, they came back with a piece of paper with the word bang written on it. My paddle is keen and bright, flashing with silver, follow the one who's fly, dip, dip, dip and swing. Dip, dip, dip and swing her back, flashing with silver, Follow the wild goose fly, dip, dip, and swing. And that's a beautiful round that would be sung at the campfire, and that's the song that the book is named after. There's a chapter on eating. Of course, eating is a very important part of summer camp. Growing up in a family, you get used to certain kinds of food and certain routines and protocols around eating. The process of feeding a large number of people requires physical settings and procedures that are very different from those of the family kitchen. Earl had a strategy to survive in the underfeeding he experienced at Anglican Church Camp in Saskatchewan in 1960. The food was awful. I think they put all their money into the new camp and forgot about food because it was really sparse. I was hungry all the time. That's probably one of the reasons I didn't go back the next year. The only two things there were lots of was white bread and ketchup. On the table there would be a pile of white bread and ketchup bottles. The food was doled out and I know that everybody at the camp would eat that and then we, we would each have two or three of what we called ketchup sandwiches. There wasn't any butter or anything. You just take two pieces of bread, smear it with ketchup, and eat that because it filled the void. I can't remember. I can't remember. I can remember being hungry all the time and thinking, "This is not right." When Lucy was a counselor at Camp Jubilee in the 1980s, an animal had taken up residence in the mess hall. Usually, on the fourth day out, you got stewed prunes for breakfast to keep you regular. Now the way you make stewed prunes is you soak your prunes the night before in a large pot and then in the morning early you get up and you actually stew your prunes. There was one session when we didn't get the stewed prunes because the pack rat that lived in the ceiling of the dining hall had drowned in the prune pot. And you know, a pack rat is a fairly large rodent anyway and when they drown they swell up and they well, there was a lot of rat in that pot. So needless to say, we didn't have prunes that session. As far as I know, everybody kept pretty quiet about it. I guess they didn't want the parents to hear about it. Oh, the porridge at summer camp, they say, is mighty fine. Say the little extra to give your shoes a shine. Oh, I don't want no more of summer camp. Gee, Mom, I want to go. Gosh, Mom, I want to go. Gee, Mom, I want to go home. 
Oh, the pancakes at summer camp, they say, are mighty fine. One rolled off the table and killed a friend of mine. Oh, I don't want no more of summer camp. Gee, Mom, I want to go. Gosh, Mom, I want to go. Gee, Mom, I want to go home. Another song from the Army. Camp is the first place children encounter adults in authority who are not parents or teachers. Not only that, the campers don't have time to get to know these adults before they're under their supervision 24-7. Rika's first year at Camp Galilee as an eight-year-old in 1957, her cabin counselor was a buxom blonde. I remember her looking like a somewhat outsized Marilyn Monroe. We were all fond of her, but she had a very odd bedtime routine. After all the campers went to bed, the cabin counselors stayed up and socialized. Of course, we rarely went to sleep right away, so by the time the counselor came back to the cabin to go to bed, we were still awake. When she came in, she told us to get out our flashlights and shine them on her while she got undressed. I can still see her voluptuous pink body in the middle of the cabin, surrounded by darkness, lit up like a dancer on the stage. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. I guess I thought it was just a clever way to avoid stumbling around in the dark to get undressed. In fact, I hadn't even remembered it until now. I wonder whatever became of her. Don't answer that question. <laughs> Being at camp means being away from all the comforts of home. A warm house, your own bed, a closet full of clothes, and a convenient, familiar bathroom. At camp, you are thrust into an unfamiliar environment where you sleep in the same quarters as a bunch of other people and have to figure out where and how to perform your daily bodily functions in facilities that are more primitive and more geographically dispersed than those at home. You also have to share your most intimate processes with a crowd of other people. Elaine came from a large family and attended Camp Latona as a 12-year-old in the 1960s. The lack of privacy bothered me. We always shared rooms at home. I mean, there were six of us, so of course I was always sharing a room with a sibling. So it wasn't like I wasn't accompanied, accustomed to my own room or anything, but the constant lack of privacy, like you're having to take a shit beside other people, like, whoa, I hated that. I didn't like sleeping close to other people. I can see the group showers, which I found extremely embarrassing. We were coming up to puberty and our bodies were changing and I absolutely hated it. I hated looking at other naked girls and me being naked until I could wrap my towel around myself. Actually, I remember when I went to Camp Galilee the first time, that was the first time I'd been in an outhouse and it was a three-seater. And I thought, oh, this is neat. I can talk to people while I'm having a shit. So <laughs> it's not to everyone's taste, but fine for me. Sometimes moral behavior is taught through role playing and songs. Bob describes some particularly memorable role playing that took place at Camp Elphinstone during the Second World War. At least once every two weeks, the camp would be turned over to the campers. This was during World War II, and the whole idea was that the camp would be invaded and taken over by Germans. Some of us would be Germans, and some would be Canadians. We didn't get to choose who we were going to be. It was quite dazzling, actually. But let me say that what I think I can refer to as high-quality YMCA values were preeminent, always. Kids, even during the occupation, were treated with courtesy as per the Geneva Conventions, which we were taught. Imagine going to summer camp and learning the Geneva Convention. <laughs> One of the chapters, of course, is about religion. And here's a song to bring that chapter in. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, oh Lordy. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Look away beyond the blue horizon.
rise and I've got a home in glory land that up shines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that up shines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that up shines the sun. Look away beyond the blue horizon. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, oh Lordy. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Look away beyond the blue horizon. This verse always gets me. If you can't bear the cross, then you can't wear the crown. Can't bear the cross, then you can't wear the crown. Can't bear the cross, then you can't wear the crown. Look away beyond the blue horizon. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, oh Lordy. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. The majority of the camps described in this book had some sort of Christian affiliation. Many were run by churches, Anglican, United, Catholic, and various evangelical denominations. Boy Scout, Girl Guide, and YMCA camps were also Christian-oriented. The Christian experience at summer camp for many of my informants was what one of them called religion light, that is, relaxed, not in your face, situational religious practice. There were, however, exceptions. The most in-your-face Christianity took place at evangelical summer camps. The Oxford Dictionary defines evangelize as preach the gospel to convert to Christianity. And the evangelical camps described here certainly lived up to this definition. Twelve-year-old Allison encountered attempts to convert her at the Baptist summer camp she attended in Ontario in the 1970s. One of the sermons was about a young girl with her foot caught in a train track and the train is coming. She can't get away. She's going to die. And then her friend comes and lies beside her and holds her and dies with her. This, of course, we were told, is what Jesus Christ did for us. And I remember this. I'm looking at my best friend and I go, holy crap, I love you girl, but if I can't get your foot out of the train tracks, it ain't gonna happen. It didn't make sense to me, right? It was very far removed from what I was used to in the Anglican church. We didn't often suggest that you lie down beside someone who was attached to a railway track, regardless of how much you liked them. Oh, the deacon went down. Oh, the deacon went down to the cellar to pray. To the cellar to pray. He fell asleep. He fell asleep. And he stayed all day. And he stayed all day. Oh, the, the deacon, deacon went, went down, down to the cellar to pray. pray. He fell asleep and he stayed all day. I ain't gonna, gonna, gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. Oh, you can't get to heaven. Oh, you can't get to heaven. On roller skates. On roller skates. Cause you roll right past. Cause you roll right past. Those pearly gates. Those pearly gates. Oh, you can't, you can't get, get to heaven, heaven on roller skates. skates. Cause you roll right past those pearly gates. I ain't, I ain't gonna, gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna, I gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. Oh, if I, if you get to heaven. Oh, if you get to heaven before I do, before I do, just bore a hole, just bore a hole, and pull me through, and pull me through. Oh, if you get, get to heaven before I, I do, just bore a hole and pull me through. I, I ain't gonna, gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna, gonna, gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna, gonna grieve. My Lord, no more. Oh, if I get to heaven. Oh, if I get to heaven. Before you do. Before you do. I'll bore a hole. I'll bore a hole. And spit on you. And spit on you. Oh, if, if I, I get, get to heaven before, before you do, do, I'll bore a hole and spit on you. I ain't gonna, gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. I ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. Ain't gonna grieve my Lord no more. 
One of the chapters is called All In Together, which is about the inter interpersonal relationships that happen at camp. It's a very important part of the whole experience. Summer camp is a way of speeding up and intensifying life, a crucible in the formation of a child's identity. What we wish, of course, is for this crucible to be a happy one, as it was for many of the people I interviewed. Here is Brian's experience at Webb's Holiday Acres in the 1990s. Camp was socially more comfortable than school because there was outdoor space to retreat to. You weren't stuck with everybody all the time. Partly because I was a big loner, I didn't feel actively excluded. I had trouble making friends, so I made good friends with the pig. I would go into the pig pen and he would follow me everywhere, and I felt pretty good about that. He was a massive pig. It was like, I know this relationship, this makes sense to me. He wants to jump on my back and hump me, and I just want to pet a big, warm, fuzzy mammal. And folk culture, folk culture consists of the customs and stories of a community through the generations passed on by word of mouth. Rico remembers a story that was particularly popular at Camp Galilee in 1960. So two, two main topics of stories that kids tell. One of them is bodily functions and the other one is ghosts. This, fo this falls into the former category. There was this young couple and the guy proposed to the girl and she said, I'll marry you on one condition. What's that? That you give up eating baked beans. Now, this guy really loved baked beans, which meant that this was a big sacrifice, but he also really loved this girl, so he agreed. So they got married and lived happily together. One day, she phoned him at work and said, today is your birthday, and when you get home, there will be a surprise for you. That day, he happened to finish work early, so he decided to walk home. On the way, he passed a restaurant with a sign in the window, baked beans, all you can eat. He got really excited about this and decided that since he wasn't expected home for a while, he'd go in and eat some beans. She'll never know, he said to himself. So he gorged himself on beans and then walked the rest of the way home. When he got there, his wife greeted him at the door saying, I don't want to spoil the surprise, so I'm going to put this blindfold on you before you go inside. So she blindfolded him, led him to the table and sat him down. Just as she was about to take off the blindfold, the phone rang and she said, don't peek while I answer the phone. By this time, the baked beans had begun to take effect. So while she was gone, he let out a few very loud, very smelly farts. Finally, his wife got back and was just about to take off the blindfold when the phone rang again. Don't peek while I'm gone, she urged once again. He took the opportunity to relieve himself of some particularly melodious, odiferous farts. Finally, his wife got back to him and asked, are you ready for the surprise? Then she took off the blindfold, and what do you think he saw in front of him? Twelve dinner guests. <laughs> Beans, you must know this one. Beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. The more you toot, the better you feel. So let's have beans for every meal. I just, that idea of a, a restaurant with a sign of just saying, baked beans, all you can eat, that <laughs> breaks me up. That's, that's very 1940s <laughs> somehow. One, one of the chapters is about singing, which is a very important part of summer camp life. Singing, singing is traditionally a communal experience. It is this communality that offers singing, singing's greatest joy. I wasn't surprised then that the people I interviewed lit up with pleasure when they talked about singing at summer camp. Even those who had a miserable time in camp remembered the singing fondly. For Polly, learning and singing songs at Camp Quamis in the 1950s was one of the highlights of her youth. Every day after lunch, we sang for about an hour. I have no singing voice. I can't sing worth a damn. And I think it's really the only time in my life when I ever got to sing my heart out and just have a wonderful time. I felt fabulous when I was singing. I went to camp already thinking that I couldn't sing. In fact, 
When I sang at home, my family used to turn on the radio to drown me out. If I sang to you, you'd realize I really and truly can't sing. But I could sing at camp. I had no inhibitions about singing there. Singing was one of the very big, important things about camp. One of the things I really, really liked. I did not, however, carry it over into my life outside of camp because I have a terrible ear. I'm very unmusical, which is probably why I enjoyed singing so much at camp. Land of the silver birch, home of the beaver, where once the mighty moose wanders at will. Blue lake and rocky shores, I will return once more. Boom diddy da boom diddy da boom diddy da boom. High on a rocky ledge, I'll build my wigwam. Close by the water's edge, silent and still. Blue lake and rocky shores, I will return once more. Boom diddy da boom diddy da boom diddy da boom. That's one of those pseudo Indian things that you get at summer camp, you know, where they, they you go there and you pretend you're going back to nature and you're a native, and if you can find a feather to stick in the back of your hat, you know, you do that. There's a chapter on sex in this book, believe it or not. One doesn't usually associate summer camp with sex. Here is Helen's experience at Northwood, a co-ed camp in the Adirondacks in the 1940s. There were two handsome brothers at camp, Gordon and Larry Gutstein, who are still gorgeous. I had a massive, massive crush on Gordon, and my cousin Sarah was going out with Larry. I remember I had braces, and so did Gordon. And the one point in time we actually got to kiss, our braces got entangled. And we had to get someone to come and untangle us. A horribly humiliating experience. Camp and home. For some kids, camp can be overwhelming, bringing on bouts of deep homesickness such as that experienced by 10-year-old Leela at ballet camp in Saskatchewan in the late 1960s. I came from an alcoholic, abusive home, but it was home, right? Everything was there. I wasn't expecting to be hit with just that kind of homesickness, like a cold, hard stone of missing my home. I remember I was so lonely I didn't sleep. No one else seemed to be visibly disturbed by being at camp, so I felt kind of like a baby, like I was the only one not able to take it. I guess I learned that even though my home was very miserable, it was my home. It was surprising me, feeling happy to be home in some strange, twisted kind of way. The last chapter in the book is called Looking Back, where people think about what camp meant to them. Earl reflects on his experience at Anglican church camp in the Cypress Hills of Saskatchewan in the 1960s. I think camp opened a new world for me, not in any religious or spiritual sense, but it was my first time as a person to be totally independent of my parents or friends or anybody else. It was just me that was there. I think it changed the course of my life because it made me realize that I like independence. I like being away from family. I like the adventure of this world out there that I didn't know anything about. At camp, I had to rely on myself, my self-image, my self-control, my self-discipline to be able to get along. Hello, mother. Hello, father. Here I am at Camp Granada. Camp is very entertaining, and they say we'll have some fun if it stops raining. I don't want that, this should scare ya, but my bunkmate has malaria. You remember Jeffrey Hardy, they're about to organize a searching party. Take me home, oh mother father, take me home. I, I hate Granada, it. take me home, I pray, I've been here almost one whole day. Wait a minute, it stopped hailing, guys are swimming, 
Guys are sailing, playing baseball. She does better. Mother, father, kindly disregard this letter.